Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 2. You'll remember that Matthew chapter 2, our focus is four different geographical locations that had prophetic utterances that Matthew is saying Jesus fulfills these prophetic utterances of these locations. Today we're going to be on the third one. Our text is Matthew chapter 2, verses 16 through 18, and I've titled the sermon, Weeping Was Heard in Ramah. Weeping was heard in Ramah. Of all the biblical cities, Ramah is probably the least uh, well-known. Uh, has anybody heard of Ramah in the Bible? Do you remember the stories? Okay. Well, you'll know about it today. Uh, what we're going to want to watch for, let's go ahead and read the text together. And this is going to be a, a truly rewarding uh, section of text. So, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 16. And then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he became furious, and he sent and he killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Verse 17, And, and then was fulfilled what was spoken of by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Let's take the second part of that text, the prophecy uh, by the prophet Jeremiah. And what we're going to need to do together as a church here, what we're going to want to understand is we're going to want to pull together the story of Rachel... We're going to un understand the significance of the city called Ramah in the Bible. And then we also need to know about the time period that Jeremiah was writing in. Jeremiah is writing just months before Babylon comes into Jerusalem, destroys Jerusalem, and begins taking people into exile. So the story of Rachel, the history of the city of Ramah, and the time period that Jeremiah writes in just before the Babylonian exiles. Let's tie all of that together. Let's start with Rachel first, the story of Rachel. Rachel in the Jewish uh, culture, in the Jewish mindset, Rachel was depicted as the image of tragic womanhood. The tragedy of womanhood. Rachel was depicted as the sad mother, the weeping mother, and we'll find out why. But these stories, even though we're going to talk about Rachel and Ramah and Jeremiah, these stories are all separated. So let's understand that Rachel died about 1,500 years before Christ. That's uh, seven or 800 years before Jeremiah ever writes his prophecy and Jeremiah's prophecy is 700 years before Matthew refers to Jeremiah's prophecy. So Rachel is a story all unto herself about a thousand years before Jeremiah uses her imagery. We'll remember the story of Rachel. Jacob fell in love with Rachel. He was tricked and he ended up having to marry Leah first. Leah was Rachel's sister. Then he had to work longer and he married Rachel and even after he married Rachel, Laban, the stepfather, or his father-in-law, that's what I meant, his father-in-law still deceived them, and he ended up leaving Laban with his two daughters, and Laban never gave him the dowry for his two daughters. So there was all kinds of sadness depicted in Rachel's life. Rachel was robbed of her dream marriage because her father gave her older sister Leah to Jacob first. She was robbed of her dowry, and for 14 years, Rachel was constantly taunted by her older sister Leah because Rachel was barren. Rachel couldn't have children, and so Rachel was the one that would cry, Jacob, give me children or I'm going to die. I can't handle this. I can't handle the competition with her sister Leah was having children. So we'll remember the story. Rachel has to give Jacob her slave to have children through her slave. So then that makes Leah 
give Jacob her slave and Jacob is having children with her slave. And here is poor Rachel that just wanted to be loved, wanted to have a man all to herself and wanted to have kids. And for 14 years, she could have none of that. And she expressed, I'm just going to die if I can't have a child. So she is depicted as the tragedy of womanhood, the tragic, the mother of Israel. Still more sadness is to follow Rachel because finally after 14 years, she has a child and his name is Joseph. And that goes well, but for some reason, Rachel still is not happy with just Joseph. And so she wants another child. So she goes another seven years after Joseph was born, and she agonizes and mourns for another seven years because she wants more children. And the story continues to get even more tragic as Jacob and Rachel are making their way from Shiloh, which is way north of Jerusalem, As they're making their way down to Bethlehem, the scripture says that Rachel went into labor with Benjamin. And the labor was very difficult, very hard on Rachel. She mourned and wept during the labor and she gave birth to her second son, but she died during that process. And she died just outside of Judea in a territory called Benjamin named after her son, in a territory called Benjamin, and they buried her at a place called Ramah. She will, her tombstone was made big, and it was made as a, as a marker for Israel so that all people that ever went past that, her grave, Ramah, they would see Mother Rachel's grave For centuries, that would be there. She gives birth to Benjamin. There was a problem with Rachel's relationship with Jacob in that the Levitical law applied to families, but the most strictest aspect of the Levitical law was especially in the holy city in the territory of Judea, where Jerusalem is located. Ramah is about five or six miles north of Jerusalem in the territory of Benjamin. And it might not be a coincidence that Rachel dies just before entering Judea. And let's look at the Levitical, the the Mosaic law, Because the Mosaic law prohibited a man from marrying a woman and her sister. So not only was Rachel constantly sad, constantly mourning, but really her marriage to the man who loved her was actually forbidden in the Mosaic law. Let's look at it together. Leviticus 18.18. This is an interesting section of text, Leviticus 18, because it talks about all kinds of information about a man seeing a woman's nakedness. You shall not see uh, your mother's nakedness. You shall not see your cousin's nakedness. You shall not see a woman's nakedness other than your own wife. You know, we could make a completely different sermon about that. But the biblical idea is that a man should only ever, in his entire life, should only ever see one woman's nakedness. And that was his wife's. It was never meant for a man to see another woman's naked body. But as we get to verse 18, here's a specific prohibition. Verse 18, and you shall not take a woman as a rival wife to her sister, uncovering her nakedness while her sister is still alive. In other words, you can't marry two sisters while they're both alive and be laying with both of them. So Jacob's marriage to Rachel was actually prohibited. Now, it was fine outside of the promised land. They seemed to get away with more. But as they were on their way, just on the border of the territory of Benjamin and the territory of Judea, where Jerusalem was, 
Now, the Bible doesn't say it was because of their marriage, but Rachel dies just before entering Judea. Her grave is set up there, and for generations, everybody will see her grave. Uh, Genesis 35 and verse 19, So Rachel died, and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Jacob set up a pillar on her grave, and it marks Rachel's tomb to this day. Now, <clears throat> that tomb was there for generations and generations, and all the Jews that ever left out of Jerusalem going north had to pass through Ramah to head north. There was no way to leave Jerusalem to the north Without passing. So, anytime you left Jerusalem to the north, you were going to see Rachel's grave, and it was always remembered Rachel's tears, the tragedy of Rachel's life. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 10, when Samuel, Samuel, uh, his parents were, lived in Ramah, uh, Samuel's home was stationed in Ramah, and he would travel up north to Shiloh when he would do his ministry. Another claim to fame for Ramah. But uh, when Samuel was leaving Saul, Samuel tells Saul to go meet somebody else and go meet them over there by Rachel's tomb. So 1 Samuel chapter 10, when you depart from me today, you will meet two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin. I think I mentioned this, but this spot in Ramah in the territory of Benjamin puts you five miles north of Jerusalem and about five miles further to Bethlehem. So 11 miles from Ramah to Bethlehem, but she never made it that far. After giving birth to her second son, Rachel named him Ben-Oni ben or Ben-Onai. And that's translated the son of my suffering. So Rachel always goes down as the suffering mother. Uh, Jacob will rename Benoni Benjamin. So Rachel is buried there in Ramah. That is called the road that leaves north out of Jerusalem. It's called the road of the patriarchs because that was the road that all of the biblical characters traveled up and down in and out of Jerusalem. So the summary for Rachel, try to hold on to Rachel's tragic story. A mother that could not be comforted because of her lamentations. Her tombstone is located in Ramah, a major route exiting Jerusalem to the north. We're going to fast forward from the year 1500 B.C. We're going to fast forward to about 680 BC, which puts us in the time of the prophet Jeremiah. The northern ten tribes have already been exiled by the Assyrians. Jeremiah is going to be in jail in Jerusalem because he was the prophet of God and nobody liked the things that Jeremiah was prophesying. You know, it is so important for us to hold on to these biblical stories. God raised up Jeremiah to go help his people walk in righteousness. And the people that he was giving the good news to hated him for it. There's always such an irony to me that testifying to the world of the good news results in people sometimes hating us for that good news. So Jeremiah is in jail in Jerusalem, and God tells him, Jeremiah, start writing down all of your sermons. Start writing down all of your sermons, and that is what we have as the book of Jeremiah. Matthew quoted this cry coming out of Ramah, Rachel refusing to be comforted. Uh, Jeremiah quotes that. Matthew quotes Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 31, so you can be turning to that. We'll look at it together. He quotes from Jeremiah chapter 31. Uh, it's important that we understand that that is just one piece of what's called the book of consolation in Jeremiah. The book of consolation is chapter 30 through 33 of Jeremiah. 
Jeremiah chapter 30 through 33 is a special, unique little section, and it's called the Book of Consolation because Jeremiah is telling Jerusalem, Babylon is coming to take you into captivity. You're going to be led out to captivity. But these chapters talk about a day when God will bring Israel back from captivity. So these four chapters are about hope, about looking past what's going to happen to you in the immediate future and anticipating a day when God is going to collect all of you and bring you back to Jerusalem. So these are chapters of hope, chapters of consolation. And it is in chapter 31 that Matthew refers us to one part of the prophecy where he personifies Rachel, the weeping mother of Israel. Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 2 lets us know that Jeremiah was in prison, that the Judean king put Jeremiah in prison. But I want to read to you the prophecy in chapter 31. Uh, 31, I'm going to start about in verse 7, but I just kind of highlighted verses 1 through 17. I'm just going to be kind of skipping through it. Uh, so I don't know if you'll be able to follow that easily, but I put it on the board here for you. Let's look at the prophecy that Matthew draws from when he talks about Rachel weeping, refusing to be comforted. Jeremiah writes in verse 7, chapter 31 and verse 7, For thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim and give praise and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country, and I will gather them from the farthest parts of the earth. And amongst them the blind and the lame, the pregnant woman, she who is in labor, together a great company, they shall return here. And I will make them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. He who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. Verse 13. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry, and, will, and I will turn their mourning into joy, and I will comfort them and give them gladness instead of sorrow. Verse 15. Thus saith the Lord, and here is the quote that Matthew gives us. Thus saith the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentations and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Thus saith the Lord, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. For there is a reward for your work, declares the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. Verse 17, and there is hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children shall come back to their own country. It's a section about hope for people that are just months away from being taken captive by the Babylonians and led into exile. We know that they had Jeremiah's writings while they were in Babylon because Daniel reads Jeremiah's writings while he's in Babylon and he takes comfort from the things that Jeremiah wrote. This section of text that he writes about here, one of the commentaries said the following on Jeremiah chapter 31. So even when God makes an infinite statement about his own love, it's immediately colored in with all the imagery of ordinary family life in Israelite village communities. The consolation continues in this chapter by evoking the exiles, for the exiles, the familiarity of home and the eager longing for joyous homecoming. Home to the restored life of the farming communities with their weddings and festivals and, 
and celebrations. Jeremiah is in this section talking about joy and rescue, a looking forward to a day when God was going to rescue Israel from the enemies. And he says that in that day, even Rachel will stop crying. Now, let's remember, Jeremiah is just personifying Rachel's cry because Rachel had already died back in the 1600s. Uh, Jeremiah is writing about 686, 685. So he's using the idea of Rachel crying. <clears throat> using the idea of Rachel crying as she sees all of the Israelites being taken captive out of Jerusalem, led off to Babylon, and he depicts they had to go by her tombstone. Uh, the Babylonians took the Jerusalem exiles out to the north. And so going north, all the exiles had to pass through Ramah, and so they had to pass right by Rachel's tombstone. So Jeremiah personifies that Rachel from the grave is witnessing this great exile of all the Israelites going past her tomb, and she's crying and weeping for her children. Jeremiah tries to comfort in verse 16 and says, Thus saith the Lord, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, because there is a reward for your work, declares the Lord. They will come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord, and all of your children shall come back to their own country. Even though Rachel's weeping sad is like a sad, mournful moment, the, ver the, the section of Jeremiah that Matthew is pointing to is a section full of hope where the prophecy is you can quit weeping, Rachel, you can quit crying, you can quit mourning because God has made a promise that one day He is going to bring Israel back to Jerusalem. So it's a section of hope. What's interesting, Jeremiah is also taken captive in the first wave of exiles. In the first wave of exiles that Babylon comes to Jerusalem to take, uh, the text tells us that Babylon took the smartest people the wealthiest people. And it also says that it took the most handsome, educated of the young men. Babylon knew a thing or two about how to govern a country. And Babylon also knew a thing or two about how to ruin a country. The way you ruin a country is you take away the wise people. You take away the righteous people. You take away the learned people and you leave them with no leadership. And that country begins to fall apart on its own. As they were traveling, uh, Jeremiah was included in the first wave of exiles. They took him, uh, put him in chains, and they all start traveling north as they come by Rachel's tombstone. Jeremiah would have seen it. Let me tell you about this exodus. Jeremiah chapter 40 I think this is verse 1. I didn't give you the verses. I'm sorry. But in Jeremiah chapter 40, listen to what the Word says. The Word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after the Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had let him go from Ramah. When he took him bound in chains, along with all the captives of Jerusalem and Judah who were being exiled to Babylon. The picture there is that in the exiles, Jeremiah is captured as well, and Jeremiah is taken to be exiled to Babylon along with everybody else. When they get to Ramah, the guard stops and shows Jeremiah favor. If you read the story of Jeremiah, everybody knew about Jeremiah. God gave Jeremiah favor in the eyes of the Babylonians, and so the Babylonian guard at Rachel's tomb takes Jeremiah's chains off and gives Jeremiah the option. You can go back to Jerusalem if you please, or you can follow us to Babylon if you'd like, but you're free to do as you like, Jeremiah. I love that because even in a world where people might hate us and want to take us into captivity, God can make 
the jail guard <clears throat> uh, what's the word? Like you. <laughs> John, he can make the heart of your enemy be favorable towards you. God does that, and so we see that in Jeremiah. The rest are all going. Uh, Jeremiah 31, back in the chapter 31 of verse 15. Jeremiah must have seen from his prison cell that this was going to happen that he would soon be being exiled, soon walking by Rachel's grave. And it says, Jeremiah 31 and verse 15, Thus saith the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. And he's personifying the grave of Rachel, witnessing all the exiles walking past. And it's a metaphor for the saddest moment of a mother. But that sadness is going to be replaced by joy. Jeremiah 31, 16 and 17. There is a hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children shall come back to their own country. Let's segue out of that. We've got a little history about Jeremiah. We know a little bit about Rachel. We know a little bit about Ramah. And we know a little bit about how the exiles in Jeremiah's time, how all of these stories kind of converge on top of each other. Let's go back to our text. We'll put a pin in that. And let's go back to Matthew and see what it was that happened. Matthew chapter 2. What was it that was happening in the time of Matthew that caused Matthew to throw people's attention back to Rachel's weeping in Ramah. What exactly had happened? Verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and he killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he ascertained from the wise men. At that time... Jerusalem was under a tyrant king, King Herod, the great builder of all things, the one that rebuilt the second temple there in Jerusalem. But Herod was a tyrant. Let me give you a little background to Herod. Herod was the king of Jerusalem at the time, and so God told uh, a young couple with their new son to get out of Bethlehem and run to Egypt because Herod is a very dangerous man and he wants to kill your son. Herod was determined to kill anybody that had a lineage that connected them to the royal throne of David because Herod was sitting on that throne illegally and he wanted to make sure nobody would take the throne from him. Let me give you a list of how tyrannical Herod was. Herod drowned the Jewish high priest, Aristobulus, and then Herod went to his funeral and pretended to weep. Herod executed more than half of the Jewish Sanhedrin. Herod slaughtered anybody that was a remainder of the Hasmonean dynasty. The Hasmonean dynasty were these Jewish people that had the right to be on the throne of David. They were the ones that ruled uh, Jerusalem from the time of uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, like 165 years before Christ, part of the Maccabean people. So he killed any of those people that were alive. He killed 300 court officials. He killed Miriam, his Jewish wife. He killed her mother. He killed three of his own sons. So bad was Herod that Augustus, the Roman emperor, wrote about him and said, It is safer to be Herod's pig than to be Herod's son. Herod was afraid of anybody that would come and replace him. So it is not completely out of character that Herod would have children to and under be killed. At 70 years of age, Herod realized that he would be dying soon. And Herod realized that nobody would mourn at his funeral. So in his last and greatest, most atrocious act, Herod demanded that a large number of the most distinguished Jewish citizens be rounded up and put in prison. 
And Herod demanded, on the day that I die, I want you to kill all of those esteemed Jewish citizens so that people in Jerusalem will cry at the time of my funeral. Uh, atrocities are not rare amongst kings. When Herod's son Archelaus takes over after Herod dies, the first thing Archelaus does when he comes back from uh, Rome after being announced king of Judea, he comes back and he kills 3,000 Jews and puts them all in the temple to let everybody know there's a new boss in town. Uh, Pontius Pilate, three years after condemning Jesus to the cross, Pontius Pilate arranged something in Galilee where all the Samaritan people gathered in Galilee thinking they were going to find their patriarch's bones. And Pontius Pilate had all of those Ga uh, Gal uh, Samaritans killed. Well, remember King Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that perplexed him. And do you remember what Nebuchadnezzar said to all the wise men that were unable to tell him what his dream was? Gather together all the wise men in the country, and anybody that can't tell me what my dream was, put them to death. So these large-scale, massive acts of atrocities are no shock to that first century. Maybe they are to us. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about the time that Moses was born, what did the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, demand? He told the Jewish midwives, from now on, every single male child that is born, throw them in the Nile River. Well, let's come back to King Herod. What did King Herod do? King Herod demanded that all the, baby, all the boys two years and younger in the area of Bethlehem be killed. Now, some people have thought, wow, they can't imagine the depravity of that, that thousands of babies must have been killed. Hundreds of babies must have been killed. Let me put that in perspective for you. The total population of Bethlehem was less than 1,000 people. So people smarter than myself have done the math. If you have a population of less than a thousand people and you're only killing the boys that are under two years old, they said that it was only, not only, it's a, it's a travesty, but it was a couple dozen children. Between 20 and 30 children were probably killed at that point. Far from the hundreds or thousands that some people have bemoaned. But nonetheless, at the death of these children, the women in Galilee, obviously, the mothers were mourning. The mothers were grieving the loss of their children. And that is when Matthew applies Jeremiah's prophecy of Rachel weeping over their, her children because they're gone. But what you miss if you don't go back and study Jeremiah is that there was hope in that announcement. Yes, your children are gone, but God is going to bring them back to you one day. So Matthew applies that to these mothers that are in Bethlehem weeping for the loss of their children, but the hope was to encourage them because the Messiah had been born. One day God would draw all the children back to Jerusalem. That is the whole point of this text. It is a text about hope, a text about how the Messiah would come and draw all of Israel back to Jerusalem so mothers can be consoled, so mothers can be given hope, and they can dry their tears. When we lead a little bit further in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, we have to read past the section that Matthew gave us. And if we keep reading in the same chapter, there is hope, there is the announcement of something new and wonderful that God is going to do. So let's continue reading Jeremiah. We'll pick up chapter 31, about verse 31. Here's what he says. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I brought them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. 
Verse 33, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Not only will the crying of the mothers stop, not only are they going to get their children back, but God says, I'm also going to make a new covenant that I can walk with my creation once again and they will be willing to obey me and walk in righteousness because I'll put it on their heart to want to obey me. Jeremiah consoles us with two promises that all the true Israelites will one day be gathered back to Jerusalem, and number two, that God will establish a brand new covenant. I'm going to take you to a last verse, and it's important that you grasp the concept. Hebrews chapter 12, I'd like you to turn there. Hebrews chapter 12. The author of Hebrews is going to give us the fulfillment of Jeremiah's promises. The fulfillment of how is it that Israel does come back to Jerusalem and how is it that God does establish a brand new covenant? What is all this going to look like? The author of Hebrews has tied it all together for us in chapter 12. Oh, I gave you the slide here. Jeremiah consoles with two promises. All true Israelites will return to Jerusalem. Number two, God will establish a new covenant with Israel. And that's what we're going to look at here. The fulfillment is in Hebrews chapter 12. We'll start in verse 18. For you have not come to what can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further message be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given, that even if a beast touches the mountain, it needs to be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. The Hebrews author has just categorized the old covenant. The old Mosaic law that God had established with Israel that was terrifying and people were too afraid to even come near this old covenant. Here's the new one, verse 22. That's not the mountain that Christians have come to. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. This is a heavenly Jerusalem. This is not a Jerusalem that can be touched. This is not a Jerusalem that you can point to on a map. This is the Jerusalem that is in heaven, and that is what you have been called to. You've been called to innumerable angels and festal gatherings and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, who is the mediator of the new covenant. This is the beauty, the blessedness that Matthew wants us to see. If you were just to blaze through Matthew, I don't think you would see the beauty that we were meant to see. The promises of someone coming to bring all the Israelites back to Jerusalem were fulfilled in Christ. The promises that someone would come establish a brand new covenant that would make it possible for us to walk in a righteous way, pleasing to God, were fulfilled in Christ because these promises are not physical, not something you could touch. They were spiritual, something that existed in heaven. And Jesus has brought that for all of us. So Matthew is alluding to the fact that women may be in Bethlehem mourning the loss of their children, but that mourning is going to be turned to joy because God is going to do something wonderful and miraculous and amazing through this baby Jesus, a carpenter from Nazarene. 
that is going to fulfill this promise of a cry coming out of Ramah that was pronounced by Jeremiah. You've not come to a mountain that can be shaken. You've not come to a city that can be shaken, that can be touched. You've come to a spiritual city, a place where holiness resides, a place where God resides, the Jerusalem that is in heaven waiting for us. That is going to conclude the third geographic location that Matthew alludes to. I hope you've been blessed by that. I love that, especially since uh, uh, the concept of Ramah is so uh, uh, unfamiliar to most of us. But what a joy, uh, what excitement that He has given for us. God's graciousness towards us, God's mercy towards us, that Jesus Christ ushers us into the heavenly Jerusalem so that we can come into the presence of God as we worship Him. So neat. Let me pray. I'll dismiss us and we'll have a song. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your glorious message. Father, what a miraculous series of events that are beyond our understanding, beyond the application of what we could have ever dreamt of. It had to be divine. It had to come from someone greater and outside of this world, someone that is not limited by this time, space, and matter, someone that is transcendent. What a glory it is to know you, Father God. What a glory it is to worship you. And you have let us know that we come into your presence. We come into the heavenly Jerusalem as Christians, through Jesus Christ, every time we worship you. Praise your holy name, Father. We want to lift you up and exalt you and glorify you in our life. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.